Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of uh, Small Talk, fully international edition today, as we have Bruno and Kenny. Hi, folks. Hello. Hi, Henrico. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you for being with us. Uh, as usual, we are announcing a new workshop, and for doing so, what's better than having a nice chat with our trainers? Uh, so we are here with Bruno and Kenny today to talk about their uh, very new uh, deep dive into model-driven design. Wow, can't wait to know more about this uh, as we enter this new edition of Small Talk. Uh, as usual, we are going to have the opportunity to ask questions to our trainers, so uh, do so uh, with the YouTube chat and LinkedIn chat. We are going to read them uh, throughout our conversation today as we uh, uncover the new topics uh, of the workshop. We are going to um, mention the important bits straight away. So the workshop is taking place next June. It's going to be a five module uh, remote workshop. So we are going to be online uh, in live streaming with uh, Bruno and Kenny uh, for five uh, mornings. Well, morning if you are in uh, Central Europe time. Um, and uh, so, without you know uh, any more words from me, I would like to ask uh, you to introduce the workshop. So, what are we talking about? What is it for? And uh, well, let's start. Off you go. Yeah. Shall I yeah. Uh, take it off, Bruno? Yeah. No, I, I introduce myself, and uh, you introduce your, yourself. Which I think it should be more polite for our audience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, pe people might know me already or not. I'm a software developer, software architect, independent consultant. My expertise is in domain-driven design and team topology. And my goal always is to enable teams to, as independent as needed, develop software, design software, and run that software. And especially that second part, design, is what we're going to uh, deep dive into because that's, I think, the bit that a lot of uh, teams and organization are still missing how can teams independently design with their stakeholders but first up to bruno for his introduction yeah thank you kenny so i'm bruno um i have more than 20 20 years of experience in it and um, i would like to explain how i discovered dd it was maybe 10 years ago i met alberto eric and matthias in a build stuff conference uh, it was for me a great moment i felt like crossing the world like an episode of a black mirror <laughs> and since this period i had not yet returned to my original world um, so i think it's important to say some words how i discover the blue book and i think it's a very strange experience for the first time I started reading the blue book and I was very surprised by not the complexity, but the li literacy style of the book. And uh, finally, yes, yeah, this one. Uh, and I written, I written, I written to it several times. And finally, I began to understand the finest of uh, Eric's words. And I fall in love about the third part of the blue book. The reason why I'm there. Uh, that's a... Uh, the motivation to this session with you. Yeah, and to, to go into that, so uh, your question, right? What What's this workshop about? It's about that part three. And what we see, well, at least what I see and observe in the community, in the domain-driven design community is that, right, people get the problem. It, it all started with me as well 12 years ago, writing software with anemic domain models, thinking that surface object pattern and then a domain model that maps with object relationships, right? Okay, yeah, that's not how you want to do. So I started using domain-driven design, got my aggregates out, got my rich domain model out, I thought. And then, okay, that worked. But it didn't feel like the promise if I'm reading the book correctly. And this is what I see the industry move now as well a lot of the time it's either a lot of people focus on strategic design which is perfect we need that 
and we're missing the depthness of the tactical design because most people that I that we encounter using domain driven design talk about aggregates, talk about uh, a value object, which is a good head start in in doing that. But the problem there is is that there's still a disconnect usually from okay, we modeled and designed it together with the stakeholders, and now software developers are starting to build software. And I think it's even in chapter two already in Eric Evans' book, right, where he says, right, there's a disconnect then between the code and the model. And that's because developers are left with implemented it by themselves. And we need that deeper connection with uh, uh, stakeholders, with domain experts, as he calls it, uh, which is what we're going to do in this workshop, go deeper into model-driven design, which also means that we can also design and model through coding. So we're going to spend a lot of time in the code, going back to uh, our modeling space, but feel that, yes, aggregates, that's the first start, but we need to go deeper. It might not even be the best start. You might not even use aggregates, right? It's just the tactical patterns, but that depthness, which is called deep modeling, that's what we see is lacking. And because we're lacking that, domain-driven design actually, in most organizations I see, doesn't live up to its promise of making software more adaptable to users' needs, making that deeper connection. Because usually we stop there. We're going to go through the whirlpool yeah. once. We got our domain model and never improve it, never adapt it, never change it. And I think that will be uh, what this workshop is about. Yes, I, I would like to add something because effectively, I'm totally aligned of the fact of the Ken, of Kenny, um, but deep modeling is a kind of approach. It's not a tool. It's a way to organize uh, your the way to deep dive and to discuss and to think about uh, your the complexity of the domain of your business roles. So generally people love solution. Aggregate, value object, entity is easy to understand, but it's very useful to protect your modeling. Yeah, it structure your code, but inside your aggregate, you have to deep, deep dive in your modeling. And that's the, the problem of uh, developer because Honestly, the, the part three is not so easy to understand for a new developer, effectively. I think that that's the, You need the to have experienced it, right? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's what I it's think. useful. You need to work, you need to have worked on a domain for at least six, yeah. better even a year. And and a second thing is we're focusing on Java and C sharp. Bruno coming from the C sharp, me coming from Java, we both possess both languages but we're focusing on java and c sharp developers at this moment so but but it's important to experience that that, that yeah uh, yeah to have on zone on this problem and to to organize the the good way to discuss with the domain expert and apply what eric said make a prototype discuss about that and make a refinement and he talked uh, about refactoring. Uh, the, 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 the title of the part three is refactoring toward a deeper design. But this refactoring is not exactly the refactoring defined by Martin Fowler. It's, a, it's another way to make a refactoring. It's a refactoring like carving the wood. It means each time you see something, you see the world is not exactly aligned with the domain. So you have to change a little. Or maybe sometimes you do a refactoring like Martin Fowler do. You, 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 but this you is speak. A, this yeah. is a good point what you're saying, Bruno, because the code is not the model. The, go, yeah. the code is like a reflection of the domain model. Yeah. So if you go into code and you see like this nice... Uh, folder called domain model. Yes, we hope that it represents the domain model, but it is not in fact the domain model. 
That's why we use supple design in order yeah. to make sure that the code in there is adaptable for the domain model, because the domain model in this case is an sort of abstraction, right? But it's the domain model is the conversation we're having with our stakeholders, with our domain expert, the understanding of our domain uh, represented in a form, um, which is kind of abstract, but that's what we're going to experience during this uh, workshop. But again, uh, we're looking at how fast can we go to code in changing that model. And that's the refactoring the domain model, which, of course, if you refactor the domain model, you need to refactor your code. Now, if you refactor your code, you also need to refactor your domain model. It goes both ways to refactoring. And that's what Eric, and that's what you went into, right, Bruno? Refactoring doesn't mean the code. Well, it does mean the code. But yeah. if you refactor the code, you must refactor your domain model, the collaboration you have with your stakeholders. And I think that's a, a good point about model-driven design. We don't want to confuse it with model-driven development, which is also a technique. So we are being explicit that it's the model-driven design by that book that we showed already, right? Domain-driven design. He's, Eric's being exact that it's about collaboration and about continuously changing the model to a deeper insight. And we only do this, of course, with where it really matters. Tackling yeah. complexity in the heart of software, right? We won't do this for a very complicated yeah. or simplistic challenge or domain challenge. We do this really, and that's also, again, what's it for? People working on complex problems uh, yeah, I, I would like to say something more because when you have a, so, something very complex, you need several steps to understand. The first step is quite bare, and the next step is quite clearer, and the third is clear. It's, it's, it's because in your mind, you have a mental, mental model growing, and you get something new. But it takes time. It, 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 it takes time. A discussion and conversation and coding to to be yeah. sure to be aligned that as an example in, in my one of my previous clients we had a very complicated actually uh domain it wasn't complex but it was very complicated and we had deep deep conversation with several domain experts like three different times and we went over three months of iteration iteration continuously updating the model, the code, the model, the code. And everyone was like, why is it, especially domain expert can get a bit, why is it taking so long? And the product owner got a bit up, upset, right? Why does it take so long? And then you have that breakthrough, come to a very simple, clean model. And after this, three months of development, you, you, you we catched up right every new feature that brought was brought in was built in within a within minutes or well not minutes hours maybe very very fast and that understanding that intrinsic understanding that's the that's what we're going through in this workshop as well we start with a naive model uh, we'll give you a naive model to work with you're going to code a bit on it and then we're going to give you a whole new feature Right? That's what happens in real life. Okay, we designed, we modeled, we took into account what we know. It's complex. We don't know the future. And while you're working on the first model, oh, the product owner comes in and says, you know what? We might be able to, can we do this? And then you're like, oh, but that's not how we accommodated the model for. Mm -hmm. And from there, we're going to start really the, 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 the model-driven design, see how we can make the code supple in order to accommodate for these new features and how we can refactor to a deeper model. That's uh, so that process we're going to go in and that makes this different from your normal tactical domain driven design workshop where you go into aggregates. And so you need to have a, a base understanding of aggregates as well and of okay. value sure. objects and how they're represented in code, because we're going to go deeper to it. We're going to work with them more. We're going to go, yeah, more uh, I think uh, I think there is a, another point very important. Uh, right, right, uh, wrote in a, in the book is to think out of the box. Uh, it means uh, 
you you can practice deep modeling if you have to more conformist. You have to think, uh, looking thing differently, and because sometime uh, you you have um, you have a bias conversation uh, conver con confirmation, uh, and you you don't see totally the problem, or you can you you imagine you solve the problem. But, that, that, that's very important in a deep modeling to, to avoid uh, this situation. Thanks both for the great uh, overview of uh, lots of what we are going to see in the workshop. Uh, I have to admit, this already covered half of the questions, but I have more. <laughs> so let's uh, dig into them. And of course, to all the folks who are watching this with us, uh, I know you are there. Uh, let us know if you have any doubts or questions for Kenny and Bruno. We are more than happy to uh, to talk about them. Before going into the genesis of the workshop, so what uh, actually made you start the idea of doing that? I would like to have, like, from one of you, if, as I said, we went quite a lot in detail into this, which is great. But if you wanted to give such, uh, let's say, a definition or a model-driven design in, say, a few sentences, what is yeah. that? Because of course it is a new concept. Uh, somehow we are uh, filled with acronyms and uh, what's yeah, not. And, no. and now we have MDD. What what is yeah. it? A MDD, MDD, MDD is actually uh, a, a connection of two things: deep modeling and subtle design. That's the definition. We, we, the, but. As a definition, it's not enough because it's, it's an approach. But uh, we we practice, as Kenny said, simple design. Simple design is, is a way to um, apply your ubiquitous language in your code, apply autonomy of your of your classes to continue to refactor. So it, 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 it's yeah, with this yeah, yeah effectively. So my my, my point is. Uh, Model driven design is not a chapter in the blue book. It's a shame. <laughs> I think. Uh, well, but it is. A, it is a pattern in the book. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a it pattern, pattern, but uh, it's, it's not well named as a um, as a sub chapter. Okay. It's, it's explained in every chapter in the part three. You you have some mention of a model driven design, and I think it's. Um, it's defined as a reference of um, DDD, the orange book, as a small one. It's, there is a definition of model uh, driven design, uh, but uh, in the blue book, no. But finally, all the part three is dedicated of uh, model driven design. Uh, so, and finally, it, because it's not so explicit in the blue book, plenty developer miss the definition and don't understand clearly what's the um, aim of uh, the part three. And uh, that, that, mm -hmm. that's a, uh, that the workshop should fix that. We yeah can't wait to see that. Of course, yeah. and it's uh, really cool to you know see that we are going so deep in a part of the book that maybe is not that, uh, as we said, uh, understood or read. And I have a question that came to my mind right now. So is to have do we need people to have read the book or the part three of the book in particular to join the workshop? No, no. It, it yeah. would be it would be nice. It's always mm -hmm. uh, nice to read it, but no, uh, because you're sense. gonna experience this uh, ongoing com dialogue between domain experts and practitioners, right? And we're focusing again, and I want to emphasize this because this is what usually always I see doesn't go or continue this continuous conversation so that also means in your code what having that conversation with your with your domain experts so that also means through code and that's what we usually or what i usually see in the industry not happening we stop from a uh, design session we stop and then the developers go back to their working station and gonna work with each other to make a pretty aggregates and value object, but there's never that ongoing collaboration with stakeholders. And that's what this is about. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, we've seen this in many other workshops. It's all about, you know, collaboration, collaboration, but then what happens when it stops, right? 
and then you have this lost in translation kind of thing, which yeah. definitely and, doesn't and, help. And I want to emphasize that um, and, and what it solves. Uh, so the why as well is what happens when developers go into code and stop the collaboration is that the code um, like moves away from the domain model because you've you've did a lot of collaboration. There's a domain model. There's a shared understanding and domain model. You go through code and there's so much in code. And that's what Eric talks about. That's uh, that you get breakthroughs or understanding, deeper understanding by. That's why upfront design doesn't work. Uh, big design upfront doesn't work because in the code, you get new insights that you need to bring back there. And if, if that bringing back from the code to the domain model, that's the focus of this workshop. So to make sure that that code keeps more aligned to the domain model, stays more aligned to the domain model. If you do, don't do that, then it's going to sit in your way because you're moving, you're moving, you're moving here. And what happens, every new change, every new feature will be harder to implement because you need to translate again. And that translation is what we try to uh, actually solve with domain-driven design in the ubiquitous language. But we're not aware that we're moving away from the domain model in our code. That's what we're gonna. That's the well. That's the pain point we're aiming to solve, right? I did domain-driven design. I did all this design with the stakeholders. Now I'm coding. Now this uh, two months later, this new feature comes in, and I uh, I don't understand anymore because there's just these nouns in my in my code, right? And I don't know what they're talking about specifically, and it's different, and I need to translate it. That's the pain point, and that's why a lot of people think well. There's so much work goes into creating aggregates and in value objects, and it doesn't work because two months after we're using it, I'm still making these translations. Yes, because we're not continuously refactoring. Yeah, it's very important. And on the developer side, uh, we need a specific uh, behavior. It means we need a self-determination, engagement, because it's not a lazy position. You can do deep modeling if you are lazy. You need to be engaged and think about it. That's very important. And you need to stop and sleep, that said Eric. It means you have a short meeting. We, we do session with a domain expert to understand deeply. And sometimes you need several days to think about. And it's very important. And to still to be engaged, to, 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 to dig deeper. That, that's very important. Nice. And, and you need to exercise a ubiquitous language all the time. It helps to think a lot. Never stops. We didn't yeah. say it was easy, right? That's no. A joke I always say at this point. <laughs> OK, so but, uh, but have... what, to go in, it, we don't say it's easy, but compared to what? That's uh... That's, That's always, also true. Yeah. <laughs> I think the opposite, not doing it, is a lot harder. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And we see results every year. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's go with some questions from our lovely folks connected with us. We start with Anthony. Thanks, Anthony. So can you outline some heuristics that can allow us to build a model and code that represents that model to be pliable and allow for changes? Yeah, um, the, this question is more about super design. Actually, super design is the answer to continuously refactoring. It means super design is a collection of patterns for your code to obtain something very supple and finally uh, change your mind and without breaking your design. Yeah, and, and if you want a very concrete heuristic, that's driven development. If you do that in compared with supple design, we always, and that's also part, a big part of this workshop is using test driven development. Yeah. We use our clear scenarios from our modeling, a test driven way, but not the normal way. We have a design, we already have design. So we're not doing dogmatic test driven development. We're doing it from the rich model that we get. And from there, um, the heuristic is don't don't use test driven development or don't use use uh, this one one I find the best 
or the most powerful. Don't use a new feature in test-driven development inside your current domain. Use it in a test. So don't use your current code and your current domain model in your code while introducing new tests. Just use it from where you're starting with the test. And this is what we're going to do in, in the workshop as well. We're going to yeah. start from our tests and then integrate it in our domain model or find out, hey, our domain model isn't optimized for this. So maybe we need to change it. And again, what Bruno said, if you use proper supple design patterns, then it would be relatively easy. Again, relatively easy, right? Yeah. yeah. Depends yeah, on the and, Yeah, I would like to say TDD outside in and not only test. That's accept, accept some tests. And it's not a unit test, it's an accept yeah. some test. Cool. Thanks a lot, uh, Anthony. Let us know if you have any more doubts on this. We go with the next one. Uh, LinkedIn user, but I know it's Federico from Prima. Thanks for uh, the question, because uh, I'm watching on LinkedIn as well. Refactoring a model in an event sourcing system can be tough to the immutability nature of the stored events. What do you think? Are you going to tackle the event sourcing even in the workshop? No, no, because um, event sourcing uh, is a specific uh, pattern uh, for a specific use case. We can use deep modeling for, for it, absolutely, but we don't want to deep dive in a specific pattern. And But to answer, um, if, if you have some invariant uh in your aggregate with some complexity you have to use deep modeling effectively uh even if you practice uh even uh, event sourcing so um super design uh is based on capability to be immutable uh you should avoid a side effect. Uh, we apply a pattern call. Um, I, I don't remember now. Um, closure of operation. It's a mat mathematical pattern to return back a type and avoid a mutation. So, Sabalizide is dedicated about um, autonomy and immutability. So, uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a good answer, but it's a it's a truth. And and I'm yeah. And I'm so we don't tackle event sourcing, but it's the same as Eric says, right? Domain modeling is it's separated from your uh, technology, or we we're going to use object oriented. But there's great books by Scott on functional programming doing the yeah. same, right? That doesn't really impact the deep modeling. Of course, it impacts the technology. We're using object-oriented because still most of the world is using that. But yeah. from my experience, actually using event sourcing makes this should make this simpler. So I'm very curious to why this can be tough due to the immutability nature of the stored event. Uh, but yeah, that's not what this workshop uh, would be about. But yeah. that in itself is already for me a flag because that means now that you're using event sourcing, it's not supple anymore because your your model in code is not easily adjustable. So now a, a domain expert comes in and he says, well, we need to go this way. And then you're like, well, you know, I've used event sourcing. I don't think event sourcing is the problem here. It should make it even easier than object oriented and functional well i'm not sure about functional programming it makes it easier to change your modeling code uh so that's for me is a very interesting question that i need to understand a bit deeper event sourcing should make it enable uh deeper modeling uh, better more subtle so thanks ken and bruno federico if you want to elaborate a bit on this and of course we are here to uh to answer and see if we can provide more insight uh yeah. we have a few more and i see that one was not picked up by um streamyard so i'm gonna write it here is by fg uh, and he says what tools that are you using for ah, yeah. traveling? 
That's a good that's a good question. So uh, I want to make this clear. We said Java and C sharp developers, but you don't need a deep understanding of C sharp and Java. We're not using almost not using any framework. We're only a unit testing framework, right? That's the only thing we're using. The rest is just plain old C sharp or Java code. So Poyo and Poco inside the code, right? Uh, for modeling, we're going to use Miro in this case, so for the whiteboard modeling. But again, we're not doing a lot of whiteboard modeling. We're going to use it to model, yes, but most will be focusing on the code. And sometimes we go back to the whiteboard modeling, of course, to, to update our domain model. But uh, I think yeah. uh, those two tools is what we're mainly going to use. So you need your favorite IDE, able and capable of running, I think, a, we start with Java 8 plus and C sharp or .NET. What was it again? Yeah, yeah. actually, uh, yeah, effectively today is uh, in Java, it's uh, Java 14 or something like that. Yeah. And C sharp is the latest version because I'm a C sharp developer. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, honestly, it's, it's the, the organization of the workshop, we, we should split people in small groups. It means uh, uh, we work together. If you don't know totally the, the language, you, you, you should be pairing with, uh, with the other. So, so it, it, sh it should not be a, a problem for you. Yeah, if okay. you don't know the, the Java 14 details, right, it, it's not a problem because we're not going to focus on the, the programming language and if like the Lambda functions or whatever Java has, we're not going to focus on that. We're really going to focus yeah. on the modeling aspect. Uh, yeah inside the code so nice cool well thank you both let's see if these answered the question and uh if not we're here there's two more questions as of now please uh do more we are gonna be here for another 10 15 minutes max i would say but now it's time to show the picture how about that bruno i know uh bruno prepared a very nice picture for the, this workshop we uh, yeah. spoke about the whirlpool which uh, we all know about when it comes to uh, Eric's book, but we have our Whirlpool. Okay. So wait, some words about uh, this uh, picture. And because when we start to discuss with Kenny, and because there, there is already a, a picture provided by Eric's uh, about uh, refactoring deeper uh, towards a deeper insight. Um, I, 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 we, we were uh, very... Uh, it, it should be better to uh, create something uh, ourselves. So the first reason is to design our commitment for uh, this uh, workshop. The second reason is to humanize the original dragon, because if you see uh, the Wyom pool process model exploration is um, a collection of arrow, but there is no people uh, around. And because we, we want to um, have an illustration of a team, uh, have a conversation to the domain expert, uh, and we want to keep the spirit of the original one. Uh, that, that, that was uh, the goal. And um, the, the third reason is to find a way to embrace uh, all the part three. So it's the reason why you, you, you notice uh, on the right, there is a cloud with a, with a storm uh, for the breakthrough, actually. <laughs> That's the illustration. And... Uh, yeah, so, the, the, the main reason of it being a cloud, because if you have went through this deeper modeling, it can be frustrating from time yeah. to time. It can be conflictuous, right? You can, I always see conflicts popping up, frustration popping up, why it takes so long, and all of a sudden there's a flash, and I'm like, wow, breakthrough. And uh, that's why we added that breakthrough in the middle of the team working, and the team here with their, uh, well, domain experts right again we're, we're focusing very much on that collaboration with domain experts even while we're doing code probing yeah and uh you see we discussed together and honestly 
uh, when I, because I, I'm a drawer and I, I draw a prototype, a naive uh, picture on the, of my notebook, and I take a picture I send to to Kenny, and Kenny said, "Wow, it's correct, but I see something else." Okay, so we we start with another one and another one. And finally, I move on the tablet. It was easier to, to communicate to Ke Kenny. And it was time to make a conversation. So Kenny start to think about the conversation. And even on, on this part, we iterate uh, a lot to find the good conversation to illustrate the workshop. So that that's a, a kind of illustration we start from nothing and we growing the the idea we we have a new uh, mental model at the end and we obtain this picture it's not necessarily perfect but it illustrates the, the workshop and it's uh probably on the web page uh, so uh, you can find that uh over there as well i'm gonna share the link to the workshop now uh, as we go through the other two questions we have, uh, just give me a second. So, uh, one is more of an observation, but I think it's worth uh, mentioning that somehow. It's by Victoria. Thanks, Victoria. I absolutely love the continuous refactoring approach, but sometimes you have devs that are absolutely terrified of changing anything about the system. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're going to go into a bit of uh, consultancy, but. but... <laughs> Uh, what I usually see is a disconnect, and that's what Eric talks about a lot, right? A disconnect with the underlying model. So the code has a disconnect with the underlying model. And yes, I would be terrified of changing something in a system that I don't understand what we'll do in the, in the business side, on the domain side. So there's no alignment anymore. So it's like, oh, this button, and then a lot of these uh, that's how I imagined it, like a lot of arrows or a lot of wires going to the business. So I'm not sure, do I need to cut the green, the blue or the red wire now? And what does that happen in the business? That's And that's what we're trying to solve here with the model-driven design is to keep that intrinsic. Oh, yeah, of course, we need to cut the red ribbon here uh, because I know I understand perfectly how this will change my business. Uh, and that's the... Um, that's why a lot of people are terrified of changing anything about the system because the domain model and the words in the code don't respond to each other. So if someone is saying, Kenny, change the blah, 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 I look at the code and I don't see the blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, what is this? And what do I change? And it doesn't match anymore. And I would be terrified if I'm, well, I've worked in an asset management domain. I would have been terrified if I didn't under, I, I was terrified the first month I came in. Someone say, can you please change this interaction of 2.5 million? And I'm like, what? And then someone showed me and I'm like, oh, what this person says actually matched my code. Oh, now I feel much more comfortable of changing that code. Uh, and that's what we're trying to battle, right? That fear of, okay, I know exactly how this change impacts my product, impacts my business. And, oh, if I change this, this can be a high-risk change. So let's start collaborating more again with my stakeholders. Again, I actually witnessed this, a user going into my code and actually go to my code and he says, Kenny, this piece of code, and this person was no coder, this piece of code is wrong. The calculation is wrong. It should be different like this. And I'm like, okay. That was 80,000 uh, in, 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 uh, <laughs> in problems there. And that's nice. So I could, I could put that user, this was an economical domain, so it's not totally fair because, of course, they could read my uh, calculation in the code a bit because that matches, but the code surrounding it, the naming surrounding it all made sense to this person. So I could easily change that, push a button, go to production, fixed. And that's the power. And that's why I wasn't terrified of changing the system anymore because I understood exactly what the business, what the impact was of my code to the business. Yes, and um, I would like to say, in general, when we do the deep modeling, we, we suppose we are in a core team. And it means uh, 
we create something new and we are protected by the bonded context. And if we start it in a legacy system, uh, I prefer to use a bubble uh, pattern, bubble context to protect me and to start with a clear and integrity card, not in a pure legacy system is very, very difficult. And that, dangerous. Yeah, yeah, very dangerous. Thanks both. So one of the pain points we're aiming to solve here is also, you know, avoid being so scared and making sure uh, code and uh, business requirements are kind of the same from start to finish. And I would say for real. Yeah. Um, last one for now. Uh, we have a uh, voter. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, is there a curve of change frequency? Uh, do the number of larger changes to the domain in code get less over time? This um, we get. Yeah, the it's a very good question. It depends. Of course, it depends on your domain. But from my experience, um, going through a couple of these iterations, like, like the, the the one I did previously, right? Doing that for a complex domain takes time, like three months. But after the three months the number of large changes went down. All the changes were done in one or two days and it could continuously. And it was even so much. And this was interesting that I came to work one day and I'm like, okay, and how, how is this new change going? And I say, well, yeah, it's on hold. I say, oh, okay, why? Yeah, the business isn't ready for this change. We went too fast. And I'm like, okay, we have another problem, but it's a better problem this time, right? Uh, so yes. Uh, I can see that, but it, again, it depends on the complexity of the domain. It depends on the market you're in. That can highly affect it. But overall, uh, if you do this, and again, I would like to state that that you don't do this for for more supporting domains, as we call in domain domain design, because the investment is not worth it, right? You really do this deep modeling more for complex core. Uh, domains. So, and then yes, it's well worth it. The number of large changes to the domain of codes get, get less over time, except of course when there's a well, COVID happens or something because that can <laughs> screw it all up. Yeah. But yes, well, I know Wouter and Wouter understands that. But, yeah. Yes, uh, I would like to have uh, the um, engagement more you are engaged, more it's easier for you to understand everything. Everything is precise. And your capability to change some part of your system, of your code, become very easy if you apply simple design. So effectively, at the beginning, you can change a lot of things if the model is not correct or too naive, for example. But more you, you dig uh, inside the model, more your brain understands everything deeply. That's the consequences of your engagement. And to finish that one off, I'm again going to stress it only for core domains. Uh, <laughs> else we're going to end up with this whole aggregate debate, de how do you call it? Screw up, in my opinion, that everyone's using aggregates everywhere. No, you do it for in a particular reason. This is not the silver bullet that we're talking about. We're using it for core domains, for complexity, and there it has it has a definite payback over time. Super. Thanks both, and thanks for all the questions. Um... I would finish off with some suggestions. So we're going to see each other, as we said, in June, again, uh, online for this training. Um, is there anything we can recommend to our um, learners online that they can watch, read, yep. to come prepared for the workshop? But not only, of course, because we yeah. want to. There is some. Um, I, I think Kenny, uh, Nick Chun of... Um, I have a session about uh, uh, model driven design, but it don't call it. This is treasury something uh, pi. Uh, it takes the example of Eric because he, the example is by uh, of pi actually. That, that's but the same subject. 
Yeah, we also did a talk at Kandinsky last year. Yeah, yeah, early. yeah. I think that yeah. video is online, so you can go yeah. to either Kandinsky website. It's also on my website. Yeah, so you can watch that video, which gives a short and quick overview of what yeah. you're going to do. So yeah, it gives you sure. a bit of a demo uh, yeah. there. And uh, Bruno and me over the next coming months will uh, work on a blog post uh, to go a bit more in depth on this. So yeah, I think it's either start with the blue book part three. Watch our video if it if you want to take less time, <laughs> and uh, check out Nick uh, Nick his thing. Yes. Super. Well, thanks a lot, folks. We covered a lot of ground, and I hope all the folks who watched us uh, got a lot of value out of it. Uh, let me remind you again: we're gonna see each other hopefully June for your workshop. And uh, in the meantime, let us know if you have any questions. Uh, we are on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, everywhere. And also reach out to Kenny and Bruno if you have more specific questions about the workshop. And uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Enrico. Thank you. See you Bye -bye. soon. Bye-bye.